Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kilowatt. My name is Bodie, and I am your host, and I have a big show prepared for you today. We're going to start things off a little bit different. Normally, we talk about the EV news, and then we'll jump into the Tesla news. Well, this week, we are going to talk about the Tesla news first. Sarah Poulton, a fellow podcaster, she is going to join me, and we're going to talk about alternative energy sources you may have never heard of. It was a good chat. I think you're going to enjoy it. And then we're going to go into the EV news. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our Tesla news. Tesla has confirmed that it will launch a new electrical retail business in Texas. If you remember, last year we talked about this a little bit. It may have, may have been in the beginning of this year. I can't remember exact timelines. But Tesla created Tesla Energy Ventures, but we didn't have any more information than that. I mean, we all kind of speculated that they would try to become some sort of utility company. Well, we have some more details. We don't have full deal details, but we do have some small developments as this story uh, just kind of unfolding here. Tesla will sell energy on the retail market to the utility or utilities. So just to be clear, a person who lives in Texas will not be able to buy, buy their power directly from Tesla. It's the utilities that will purchase the power from Tesla as Tesla generates it and then obviously stores it. Tesla has been rumored to be developing something similar to this in uh, the UK, and I'm sure they're they're looking at other markets as well. So I think this is pretty cool. As we get more details, I'll go ahead and fill you in as they roll in. But this is something to keep in the back of your mind. Tesla has turned off the ability to order the Model 3 long range in the United States and Canada because the demand for this vehicle is so high they can't produce them fast enough. When we had the last Tesla earnings calls, I don't remember if I played it or not, but Elon mentioned that this might be something that they have to do in the near future. Obviously, they're doing it. Not only did they take down the ability to order the Tesla Model 3 long range, they also removed the price. And that makes sense because in 2023, when they reopen the ordering, the car is almost certainly going to cost more. It might cost a little less, but Tesla doesn't want to be putting up a price of today's prices and then change it in, let's say, February of 2023, and it's gone up $15,000. So this does make sense to me, but I... I'm of two minds. One, it, it makes sense to me and I think it's a good thing, but I also think it's kind of a good thing to let people choose whether they want to order the car and sit on that reservation or just go out and buy a different vehicle altogether. I can see both sides to this decision and the, by both sides, I mean to the binary options that I just gave you. There's probably an infinite amount of sides uh, that that you have to look at when you're making this kind of decision. I'll keep you updated when they open up the ordering system if you're looking to buy a Model 3 long range. Let's talk about Optimus Bot, Tesla's robot or humanoid robot. Elon wrote an article about the humanoid robot, and the article is in Chinese. So here is an excerpt poorly read by me from Elon. Today's cars are increasingly like smart web connected robots on wheels. In fact, in addition to the to cars, humanoid robots are also becoming a reality with Tesla launching a general purpose humanoid robot, Tesla bot in 2021. Tesla bot is close to the height and weight of an adult. They can carry or pick up heavy objects, walk fast in small steps. And the screen on the face is an interactive interface for communication with people. You may wonder why we designed this robot with legs because human society is based on interaction of a bipedal humanoid with two arms, 10 fingers. So if we wanted the robot to adapt to its environment and be able to do what humans do, it has to be roughly the same size, shape and capabilities of a human. Tesla bots are initially positioned to replace people in repetitive, boring, and dangerous tasks. But the vision for them is to serve several millions of households, such as cooking, mowing lawns, and caring for the elderly. Achieving this goal requires that robots evolve to be smart enough 
and for us to have the ability to mass produce robots. Our four-wheeled robots, cars, have changed the way people travel and even live. One day, we will solve the problem of self-driving cars, real-world artificial intelligence. We will be able to extend artificial intelligence technology to humanoid robots, which will have a much broader application than cars. We plan to launch the first prototype of the humanoid robot this year and focus on improvement and intelligence of that robot in solving the problems of larger scale production. Therefore, humanoid robots' usefulness will increase yearly as production scales up and costs fall. In the future, a home robot may be cheaper than a car, perhaps in less than a decade. People will be able to buy a robot for their parents as a birthday gift. It is foreseeable that with the power of robots, we will create an era of extreme abundance of goods and services where everyone can live a life of abundance. Perhaps the only scarcity that will exist in the future is for us to create ourselves as humans. So a couple of things here. That last statement, perhaps the only scarcity that will exist in the future is for us to create ourselves as humans. That's a nod to Elon's worry that we're not going to reproduce enough as a species to sustain life. And maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem like that's probably going to be true, but it could be not for many, 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 many years, but sure that could be true. Here's the other thing is, you know, as a rule, I don't think these AI robots are going to come out of the gate and be successful. I, I think there's going to be a lot of problems, just like when Tesla set up the the first lines for the Model 3, there were a ton of problems that were unforeseen. I think these robots are going to have a ton of problems that are unforeseen. And Elon's not saying it's going to be easy. Hopefully we'll get there, but I don't think it's going to be any time in this decade. Now, having said that, in twenty. In the 2030s, I'll be 60 years old. I'm waiting for my kids to buy me a humanoid robot. I want this. Please give this to me. Um, I am very nervous that when I get into my old age, I will have to, like really old age, I'll have to wear diapers. And I don't want my kids to have to do that. Give it to the robot. Totally fine with that. Let the robot take care of me and my doddering self. <laughs> Can't wait for AI Day. Moving to the next story. A JD Power study found that electric charging infrastructure isn't holding up to the growing number of EVs being sold. And shocker. I don't think anybody's shocked to hear that. Uh, Tom Malagny had a really good, and I'll try to remember to put it in the show notes, but he had a really good video on what it costs to charge his F-150 Lightning from zero to hundred percent, but he also goes through like kind of the challenges and, and issues with the top four charging networks for regular EVs. Tesla wouldn't be in there because you can't currently in the United States charge an F-150 Lightning on a Tesla charge or on a, yeah, on a Tesla charger. But it was a really good video on some of the challenges that consumers are facing in the third party DC fast charging network. So if I can't, if I don't remember to put the video in the in the show notes, it's Tom Malagny, State of Charge. It's one of his newest videos. Uh, it's really good. All right. So here is how JD Power measured satisfaction with level two and DC fast chargers. So ease of charging. This one probably scored okay. It's not super hard to charge. You, you just plug it into the car and you're good to go. The speed of charging, depending on where you live, uh, this could be great. This could be awful. If you're on a DC fast charger, if you're on a level two charger, public level two charger. Ease of payment. I don't have a lot of experience with third party chargers, but the, with the limited experience that I do, this is a mixed bag. Some third party charger charging companies make it painful to pay them. Like you have to set up an account and then you have to like, I think EVGo sent me like a card that I have to use and scan or I can use the app. It, it was just not a good experience. I just want to walk up, swipe my credit card or tap my phone and charge. How easy was it to find 
the charger, like finding the location of the charger. And once you found the charger, was it convenient? So if you're at a mall in, let's say, Chandler, Arizona, it might be easy to find the, the charging stations at the Chandler Fashion Square Mall, but there's only two charging locations or there's only two chargers at this location. So your convenience may not be very good on a Saturday or Sunday because the mall is always filled. And those spots, I think there's four spots to charge your vehicles off of these two chargers. They're always filled as well. So, um, you know, it kind of depends on where you live. Were there things to do while you were charging? I think this is really important. How safe did you feel at this location? The, avail the availability of chargers, like once you got there, were they available? Were they in, you know, were they working? And then the physical, physical condition of the charging station. I hear a lot of complaints. Uh, I get emails about, you know, this location is down or has been down for this amount of time. And it's just people wanting to inform me of this. And I think this is great. I have no issue. I don't really report on it because I don't make tr charging stations a big part of my show. But I do like hearing about what's going on out there. However, no one emails me when a charger works and there's lots of things to do around that charger. So I only hear the bad stuff. That's another reason why I really don't talk about it. But those were the criteria that JD Power used to measure this is this is shouldn't be a shock to anybody like it, it's it's problematic, but it's not impossible. And there's lots of room for improvement and we'll we'll get there for sure. It's just going to take a little bit of time and some planning. You need to have apps like uh, a better route planner and uh, what what's the other one? There's another one that will tell you where chargers are and I'm completely blanking on it. I don't even know if I have it on my phone anymore. <laughs> So this is really bad podcasting. Nope. Don't have it on my phone anymore. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Germany is unhappy with Tesla's charging network, or they will be unhappy if Tesla doesn't fix this issue by June of 2023. Tesla chargers don't meet the minimum German requirements for EV chargers. Here's the issue. The Tesla charger doesn't display the current output on a screen outside the charger. So if you've never seen a Tesla supercharger before, it doesn't have a screen on it at all. All of that information is given to you through the in-car display, you know, infotainment system, or is given to you on the app. So um, right now, Tesla's not in compliance, but I'm sure by June 2023, they'll retrofit some screens onto the chargers and it should be good. And in our last bit of charger news this week, I just said I, we don't really talk about chargers on this show and three or four stories in a row, but here's our last one. Tesla briefly launched a program for non-Tesla owners to charge on the supercharger network here in the United States. Now, this was found in the Tesla app, and I believe it was found by Sawyer Merritt. It was briefly available. Here's what we know. There were two options. You could pay per use where you don't get any discount, or you could pay 99 cents a month and you would get a discount on charging. Uh, Tesla has removed this feature. They removed it the same day. It went up at like at 9.30 or 10 in the morning on the 17th, and it was gone before midnight on that same day. So it sounds like it was posted by mistake or possibly Tesla put it up to just kind of see what people's feedback would be. In either case, um, this option is currently down. We don't know for sure what the official membership offering will be, but Tesla and Elon have said in the past that, that this is definitely going to be an option for non-Tesla owners. We just need to we just need to see where Tesla's at in terms of what they're going to offer it up as. Tesla and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration are button heads over FSD again. Um, in this case, though, it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a funny button heads. Uh, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration owns a Tesla with FSD but they have not received access to the FSD beta despite having a safety score of 99. And at some points they've had a safety score of a hundred. Now, if you've been following this for quite some time, if you've had a safety score that high, you just get access to full self-driving beta. So a document 
a note, whatever you want to call it, was sent to Tesla from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, laying out the details and very politely asking on what steps they need to take to get access to full self-driving. They also requested some of Tesla's time and expertise to figure this out. Well, whole Mars catalog um, at whole Mars catalog on Twitter, Omar, he tweeted out a screenshot of this document and replied, and Elon replied, excuse me, okay, we'll turn it on with a laughing emoji. emoji. Um, this kind of, th this, I don't know why, but this makes me giggle that Tesla was holding full self-driving beta from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, and they had to kind of come with a somewhat bended knee and like, can you please help us out with this? We're just trying to get this feature turned on. Uh, spiteful, but funny. I do think that it would be a benefit uh, for the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration to be able to test this out for everybody involved, not just consumers, but probably Tesla, because there's a good feedback loop there and they're a government regulatory organization. Um, but yeah, it's kind of funny. Now, I told you that story, so I can tell you this one. Ralph Nader thinks Tesla full self-driving technology is one of the most dangerous and irresponsible actions by a car company in decades. Ralph has uh, similar opinions to Dan O'Dowd that we talked about last week. He is asking the National, Ralph Nader, is asking the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration to issue a safety recall and remove S FSD from every Tesla, which I believe is about 100,000 Teslas. I think this is a little melodramatic. Um, I don't know or haven't been convinced that FSD is any more or less dangerous than an inattentive driver. Like I see inattentive drivers all the time, especially when I'm driving the fire truck. Like you can look down and see what people are doing. And most, if not all, are on their phones. Like my captain who sits in the right seat, I sit in the left seat. We can see people driving by and <laughs> they're on their phones. Like you get a good look into their vehicle. So this is, you know, I don't know that it's any more dangerous than not paying attention, uh, but you should definitely be paying attention if full, full self-driving is enabled and if you're just driving on your own because you don't want to kill anybody or yourselves. And correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I believe Tesla has said that they will remove you from the beta program if you're doing something super dangerous. So maybe Tesla needs to police this more so that people know that they're they're serious, but... I'm pretty sure Tesla has said that and they've removed them people from the beta test, but I might be misremembering or maybe I think I read something. I don't have any receipts to prove that. And one more bit of random full self-driving information here. The California DMV has accused Tesla of false advertising. Evidently, Tesla hasn't had to report crashes or system failures to the state of California because FSD doesn't technically fall under California's advanced driver assistance system category. The DMV chose to reevaluate Tesla's standing after several YouTube videos shows showing owners using FSD irresponsible, irresponsibly and some of you know Elon's comments about the technology and what it can and can't do, which is mostly what Elon is saying what it can do. We won't hear anything official from the reevaluation until it's complete. One of the penalties, though, that Tesla is facing, and it may include, although I really doubt it, revocations of licenses to make and sell vehicles in California. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Tesla is probably going to get a small slap on the wrist and told to start reporting. I don't even know that they're really giving any false advertising to the state of California. I don't know what kind of paperwork they submitted and what they said in their, their submittal, but uh, you know, Tesla and Elon have pretty been pretty forthcoming on what they think full self-driving should be. Uh, they haven't been so forthcoming coming on what it currently is. Uh, but that's just my issue with Tesla selling features that they don't quite have yet. All right, that is it for our Tesla news this week. If you like what I've been doing with the show, but you don't like ads, consider go to patreon.com forward slash kilowatt and signing up for $1. That's, that's all I ask for a minimum of a dollar to help support the show. All of the money goes back into the show I'm working on a website for the show. I'm working on some other things for the show to hopefully give it a more um, well-rounded experience for everybody. 
But all that takes money. So if you want to help out, all I ask for is a dollar and you get a Patreon RSS feed that is 100% ad free. Sarah Poulton, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, we're going to do kind of an alternative energy roundup in this segment. And I'm really excited to have you here and, and walk through this with me. So are you ready to start? Yeah, I'm excited to be here. I feel like I'm going to either like your audience is going to love me or they're going to hate me. It's going to get really polarizing and I'm excited to see which way we go today. <laughs> Well, I think they're going to love you because uh, they they appreciate candor. Fair. And uh, yeah, I was once told, I told somebody once that I appreciate their candor. She's like, are you calling me rude? <laughs> I was like, not really. But, but yes. Uh, okay, let's start here. Uh, these are just seven, seven different energy sources, renewable energy sources that maybe the audience hasn't thought of. So let's start with number one here, solar wind. At the University of Washington University, scientists are working on an ambitious project to harness the power of solar wind, which is success, if successful, could generate a billion, billion gigawatts of electricity. That I didn't stutter, it's two bill, a billion, billion gigawatts, which seems like a lot. Seems like there should be a number for that. But anyway, that's 100 billion times more power then the planet currently consumes the technology for harnessing solar radiation in space that already exists, as demonstrated by Japan's interplanetary spacecraft powered by the solar winds. Uh, the big challenge for scientists is how, far, how to transfer those billions of gigawatts back to the Earth. So far, they haven't figured it out. What are your thoughts, Sarah? Uh, I mean, my thoughts initially are solar wind sounds like the next sci-fi horror movie. Um, in which there's some kind of wasteland and we're all trying to survive the solar wind. Um, but you know what, if they can do this, how incredible would it be? And I, I also imagine someone's going to immediately find a way to monetize it <laughs> so that it's not free for yeah. everyone. Yeah. My first thought is a couple of maybe a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, there was a big, huge hack like from the, in the technology sector and the company that was kind of like the source, source, the bedrock of that hack was called Solar Winds. So I was like, even though that's technically what it is, it's it's bad branding by the University yeah. of Washington. They should consider naming it. Yeah, let's rebrand it. Let's rebrand it. Put something <laughs> like uh, cool on it. Make it snappy and um, and then sell it to us for twice the price of our uh, electricity. <laughs> right. Solar Breeze. There you go. Oh, I like maybe. that. Yeah, it's like a 1970s, like, chill rock music. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I would listen to that station. Let's go with number two, which is algae. Algae offers huge commercial potential because the carbon that's released has recently been taken, like, straight out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis. The impact on algae fuels on the atmosphere is actually much lower than uh, hydrocarbon fuels. Algae fuel produces... Production has a minimum impact on the land, the water, the resources, as its farms require relatively little space compared to like cereal farming, which is your wheats and your oats and stuff like that. And it can be produced using seawater, even uh, wastewater, like gray water. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I want to know who looks at algae and is like, yes, I'm going to use all my power from this. It's pretty incredible. I used to work with a guy, um, he recently retired, but I used to work with a guy who wanted to create an algae farm for biofuel. I've never heard of any of this. No, it's a thing. It's a, it's big. I don't know if they're actually creating anything in volumes that would be considered like mass product. All right, let's jump into uh, pretty much probably our greatest uh, renewable resource, resource, which is body heat. Sweden's latest green energy source is Swedes. Engineers in Stockholm have devised a way to harness the heat uh, generated by 250,000 commuters who crowd into the central station every day. Body heat is channeled through the station's vent system, and then that is used to warm up 
water in underground tanks and that water, the heated water is pumped through the building. Um, nearly the, the size of the building is like an office block. The construction and installation of the system is about $30,000, so pretty cheap. But what are your thoughts on body heat as renewable energy? Uh, this is something I could totally see happening in a big city like Tokyo or, um, you know, even somewhere in Europe. I feel like in America, we're just trying to get from point A to point B alive. Like every there's so much work. Uh, I live in the D.C. area and like our metros are such a hot mess. I can't imagine anyone having their stuff together enough to install something like this. Uh, but how cool would it be? It also does sound like a bad pickup line. <laughs> like, hey, we gotta, we gotta get some body heat, man. Like, we gotta, we gotta fuel up this uh, building. Like, I mean, I, that is the same pickup line I used on my yes. wife, but we grew up in Alaska, so it's a little different. <laughs> hey, it worked though because you're married. It did actually. I got incredibly drunk the first time we met, and I puked all over the car and on the outside of the car oh. on the way home, and. Uh, she was nice enough to call me and make sure I was okay. That's that's a class act. <laughs> yeah, no, she's very nice. All right, bioalcohols. Uh, unlike algae f- fuels, biofuels such as ethanol and biodiesel, which biodiesel is can come from algae from what I understand, but it could also come from like the oil that you would... Uh, the used oil you would find at a Chinese restaurant, for instance. I have a lot of friends who run biofuels in their in their vehicles. Anyway, they are already commercially available and are uh, and their popularity is on the rise. Initially, Henry Ford wanted to use ethanol to power the, his vehicles, but petroleum was much cheaper to produce at that time. So, had ethanol been a little bit cheaper, we'd have a little bit cleaner burning fuel. This sounds very cool. Um, I think that'd be like awesome if you go to the gas station and there's just like, you know, and an, a bio alcohol pump, you know, <laughs> right there. And you could just stick it right in your car. Like, how awesome would that be? Yeah. And there's a couple of places. There's one in San Francisco. And uh, I, I know I, he's not a friend, but I know somebody that lived up there and he was very irritated because he wanted to use biofuel. But it was quite a bit more expensive there than it was uh, just for regular diesel. He was pretty upset. But you can actually, like the friends that I have that use biodiesel, they actually go and pick up the oil themselves and then they go home and they they go through the process of refining it. So it's almost free. Um, You can use, like I said, Chinese oil from Chinese food, oil from like fry machines. That's so cool. And your car smells like Chinese food or of fries at the exhaust just a little bit. I mean, that sounds probably better than the way my car smells now. So I'm not mad about it. Um, I also, you know, when I was house hunting, I, I didn't even know this was a thing, but I was looking at a house that was run on oil. Uh, and it was an older house. Uh, and I think if you could find a way to use this kind of energy in those types of homes, that would be pretty cool too. But I, I did end up passing on the the oil house that I was looking at. Yeah, very popular in the East Coast. You know, what's also popular on the East Coast is uh, geothermal wells for like heating and cooling. Like they they dig a big hole and they use like water heaters and stuff to pull the cool air up during the summertime and cool your house. And then when your house is below, you know, when it's cold outside, when it's below like 30 degrees or whatever, they can use that same air and heat it because it's usually like 60 degrees or whatever uh, uh, below the ground. This is, I'm talking about information that I read years ago now. So um, I might be getting some of the details wrong, but basically that, that ground air is warmer than the outside air. Mm. So it's easier to heat your house. Uh, All right. Number five, dance floors. So this is kind of fun. This goes along with the body heat. Like if you can convert the, the dance floors and the body heat together, I think we're in good shape here. We could power the world forever. Yeah. Energy floors in Rotterdam, Rotterdam <laughs> has found a way to harness the kinetic energy of the dance floor. This is converted into electricity, and then that lights up the dance floor itself. Uh, with the average person ta- uh, 
taking 150 million steps in a lifetime. There's no reason why this technology can't find wider applications. PaveGen, a London-based company, has demonstrated this uh, with developing an energy harvesting smart street, which is pretty cool because even in America, you if you're on the in the if you're rushing around, you still got to walk. Yeah, I could definitely. I, I want Lady Gaga to come out with a new song about this, so that we can get every dance floor to be uh, energy. Uh, I, I've seen some really cool like prototypes online for smart streets where you can change like the flow of traffic. You can change like you can warn people if there's like a deer in the road or uh, a car accident. Uh, so I, I like the idea of using it for roads too. Is pretty cool um, and so futuristic like. I was really hoping the 2000s would be like the Jetsons. And I feel like it's just like regular life, but with a cell phone, which is so sad. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, you, you were, I mean, we have a lot of cool things, um, but we don't have anything close to, to what people thought we were going to have to have in the 60s for sure. But anyway, let's talk about jellyfish. All right. We're back to Sweden again. Gothenburg's. Chalmers University of Technology, Zachary Chiragwanda, I'm butchering all of those words, and his team are developing a biological fuel cell derived from fluorescent proteins found in jellyfish. Uh, the team is, has so far used a proof of concept to power to a clock with their technology. Fancy th fanciful though it may seem, right now, one of these days, biocells could float on the ocean, generating cheap power with minimal impact on the environment at a relatively low cost. I know this isn't what they mean, but I think it would be cool if everybody had giant fish tanks with jellyfish that power their house. And I understand that is not at all what they mean by this, but that sounds really rad to me. <laughs> so, so this sounds really rad to me too, but that also seems like a, a horror movie in the making. Yes. That could be my next film. Yeah. I think that I think somehow the jellyfish become resentful um, that they have to do this and then they attack. I'm wondering why jellyfish, like what, who was like, yes, I'm going to take you and you're going to power this clock. And I'm also thinking how many jellyfish does it take to power a clock? Right. I'm also, I'm all, I'm kind of concerned because uh, like, I'm not an animal rights activist by any means, but what do they have to do this, these jellyfish to get that protein? I know that some at some point they can synth synthesize it, but how many jellyfish had to die to get a proof of concept? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Those poor jellyfish, question mark, if they can feel. <laughs> yeah, I I also don't want to know that I, someone got stung. I'm, I'm confident people got stung in the making of this uh, powerful clock. Uh, which I've been stung, and it is not fun. Oh, really? Yeah. It, I when I was in high school, I wrote a song. Uh, I was in a band, and I wrote a song uh, called "Stung by a Jellyfish" about a friend of mine who was dating a girl, and she was uh, very nice. But I, the the relationship didn't work out. Let's just say, and uh, yeah, stung by a jellyfish. Well. <laughs> I think at the end of this episode or the end of one of these episodes, if you can, I would love to play it, but I don't think you have it recorded. I'm going to guess. Uh, no, if it is, it's on a ah. tape. Last one here. Confiscated, confiscated alcohol. So uh, Swedes back in uh, <laughs> the, the article here, uh, they thought it was an ingenious idea in 2007 uh, to take 185,000 gallons of alcohol that was confiscated at the border of Sweden and pour it down the drain. Um, and they've been doing this, you know, for years, I guess. Authorities uh, decided to combine that fuel that they would normally just pour out with other fuel sources, such as animal remains from slaughterhouse and human wastes, which is really appealing. And it creates um, these anaerobic digesters and then that is converted into biofuel for public transport. It sounds really gross, um, and it is, but it replaced 5 million liters of fossil fuel with 5 million liters of biogas. Wow. So pretty decent. Listen, not all heroes wear capes because working at that company, whew. 
<laughs> right. And as uh, as somebody who grew up with a lot of uh, people from Nordic countries, because uh, they're all over Alaska up there, um, I don't know how. I don't. I I just never assumed that that Swedes would confiscate alcohol at the border because they're very just kind of free people. I could see Americans doing this, um, but I was yeah, surprised to hear that, that this like is something uh, that they do in Sweden. I feel like they'd be like, "That's fine, go ahead." But who mm -hmm. knows? Don't bring alcohol to yeah, Sweden, I don't know guys. What that means. We've learned a lot today. One hundred eighty-five thousand gallons just in two thousand seven. It's a lot of booze. Well, I hope that was educational for everybody. Sorry about the, the Velcro tear. Sarah, I asked you on for another reason. Uh, you have a new project coming up, and I would like you to tell my listeners what that is. Yeah, so I am co-creator of a new podcast called Stay the Night. Uh, it should be in your you know podcatcher of choice. We also have an RSS feed if you've got some kind of weird, obscure podcatcher I haven't found. Uh, and Stay the Night is an audio drama fictional podcast. It's a horror story. Uh, it's basically like a uh, feature length horror film. It is violent. It is graphic. Uh, all the trigger warnings, all the content warnings, it is explicit. Um, and if those words are exciting to you, Stay the Night might be the podcast for you. Um, and the premise of Stay the Night is about a couple named Ben and Ava who go on a road trip to uh, after reeling from the loss of a miscarriage and they stay at the Newman's bed and breakfast owned by Martha and Dennis Newman, who are a charming older couple who have no intentions of letting them leave. So it is a wild ride. There's a really crazy plot twist in there that you're not going to see coming. If you can predict it, good for you. Um, but uh, yeah, so right now the trailer is up online and hopefully in the next 48 hours there will be a premium subscription available so for 4.99 you can listen to all 11 episodes right now uh but if you want to wait and check it out the first two episodes are dropping august 29th 2022 uh and then every monday a new episode is going to drop leading up to halloween which is when we are dropping the finale which is a lot of fun <laughs> Yeah, I, I told you off mic that this is my favorite genre of horror, uh, mostly because uh, I grew up Catholic and I don't like anything that deals with spirits. Well, not that I don't. It's just I, I am a chicken when it comes to that stuff. We still watch it at work because my family doesn't like horror movies, but we still watch it at work. I just watch it with a large group of people. It's not something I'm watching yeah. my own. But this is my genuinely my favorite type because I think people underestimate old people mm. as a general rule. And um, the fact that you can have an old person who is also a little off the rocker and dangerous is it's appealing as I get closer to 50 years old. <laughs> I am con I'm concerned that you're interested in becoming a character, uh, in Stay the Night, but, uh, we got, you know, the, the actors we cast to play Martha and Dennis Newman, um, are just the most normal, regular, kind, nice people. And to see them transform into truly the most unhinged characters was such a delight, uh, especially uh, Jan Welsh, who played Martha. She's such an incredible actress because she couldn't be further from the character she played as a human. I hope. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Well, my thing is I, I aspire to be that when I get older. I don't know if I'll actually get there, but it's my my goal. But yeah, I really want to point out that this isn't like just two people reading from a script. This is like actual actors with, you know, sound design and the whole yeah. thing. It is straight out of a like a BBC audio drama. Yes. Quality work. Yes, we we actually hired um, Jess Fenton, who is a professional audio engineer um, she, and a musician. So she custom made music for the show and she audio engineered it. So it just sounds really good. And then it was edited by my writing partner, Chris Cortner, who's actually just got an Emmy nomination for editing. So like we have top talent putting this together uh, to make it just sound really crisp. And all the actors are just A1. Um, there's so much talent out there. Um, so everybody was just so incredible to work with. That is awesome. Um, tell the listeners one more time when the first episode drops. 
So the first free episode, the first two free episodes are August 29th. So I definitely encourage people to subscribe, check out the trailer. Uh, if you like it, leave a review just to get some more buzz on it. Um, and then if you like the first couple episodes and just like can't wait, or if you can't wait right now, like just download the whole thing and binge it. It's about, um, it's, I mean, it's like the length of a movie. So it's maybe 90 minutes, a little bit more total. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for being on the show and walking through the seven renewable energy sources you may have never heard of and uh, telling us a little bit about your podcast. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I feel like I've learned a lot today. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. This is some rumory stuff right here. It sounds like Hyundai is developing two EVs for the European market that will start around 20,000 US dollars. That's fantastic. If this is true, it could be huge for the EV market in Europe. And I hope it is. It's be awesome. Another rumor here, BMW will reportedly 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 use Tesla's 4680 battery format, but even though they're using the same format, That doesn't mean they're going to be using the same battery chemistry. It just means that the battery cells are going to be the same size. They could put whatever battery chemistry they want to that powers a car into that cell. All right, let's jump into our hard-hitting EV news this week. Dodge had some announcements this week. They had three 20-ish minute presentations. I listened to or watched all three presentations Um, And here's what I got out of it. Dodge is moving to electric vehicles, kicking and screaming like they don't want to, or it sounds like based on their presentation that they don't want to, but this is where the market's moving. So this is where Dodge has to go. Otherwise they're going to be extinct. So one of the vehicles that they showed off on the second day was a uh, plug-in hybrid I think it was a Dart or the Hornet or something like that. It looked okay. It wasn't like anything that was like, ooh, this is so nice. But it only had like, it had a very small battery, like a 10 kilowatt hour battery or something like that. Like it's not going to go very far on electric. So we're not going to talk about that car. On the third day though, they did show off the Dodge Charger Daytona SRT. It's a concept. But this car is beautiful. It's very swoopy. Like And it very much has that muscle car look to it. It's going to be the first electric muscle car. Dodge really didn't have a whole lot to say about the car in terms of specs because it's a concept. But here are the three biggest takeaways that I got from it. One is the boot or the trunk space in the back of the car is going to be ample. It's more than enough room. They wanted to deliver the fun of driving a muscle car with the utility. I guess utility is a bad word because I'm going to say it again with the utility of having a, an actual utility vehicle. So they give you lots of space in this, in this vehicle. It doesn't, I don't know if it has a frunk or not because they didn't open the hood. Um, it may or may not have a frunk. I hope it does. There's lots of hood on this vehicle. Like it is a very, it, it, it looks like a 19, Late 60s, early 70s muscle car. Fantastic looking car. I think it looks more like a Challenger. The inside is very nice. They didn't go into any details about the actual um, the software that they use on the vehicle. They didn't go into details on the range or any of that other stuff. We do know at some point they're going to have an 800 volt system. So that's good. But that'll probably be the Banshee, which is the most expensive version of the car. Earlier, I said that they were, you know, coming, they were, they were being dragged, kicking and screaming into electric vehicles. They made several negative comments about electric vehicles throughout the presentation. And it was just kind of in that really passive aggressive way that my grandma used to talk to us when she was unhappy, but she didn't want to say she was unhappy about something. So, uh, it was just like, it was, if, felt a little immature, to be honest. It felt a little like, yeah, we're building an electric car because young people want an electric car, but we want to continue building what we're building and what we're used to. It it's it just had that that feel. I did not like I did not like the presentations. 
It did not get me excited for an electric revolution at Dodge. It, it really turned me off as a potential buyer, honestly. But, you know, by the time this car comes out, they'll, they'll figure out their messaging. But one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to have a multi-speed transmission. So most EVs have a one-speed transmission. The Porsche Taycan has a two-speed transmission. I don't know what they're looking for. Uh, I don't know what Dodge is looking for in a multi-speed transmission other than they really, they just the same way that Dodge is being kicking and, you know, brought in kicking and screaming into the EV uh, revolution. I think they're trying to bring their customers in kicking and screaming as well, because I, I the only thing I can think of with this multi-speed transmission thing is they want it to feel as if the vehicle is shifting gears, like an ICE vehicle shifts gears. Um, and I don't think that's necessary if that's the case. The other thing is that I think is very funny and he makes the gentleman who's doing the presentation makes kind of a snarky comment about it's not going to be a quiet car. It makes vroom vroom sounds when you, you know, accelerate and stuff like that. Um, it just, it sounds on one side, it sounds cool for about 10 minutes. And then after that, I think it's just going to be very tiresome to have vroom vroom sounds when you're driving around because the, to me, the audio sounded, and I don't, I don't know what it sounds like in real life. It sounded a little compressed. Um, he, he made some reference to how they, they take the sound and they run it through these processes and blah, blah, blah. But basically they, they have a sound that goes out of speaker. That's all it is. There's nothing they really tried to make it fancy, but it's not fancy. Sound speaker. Speakers near the rear of the vehicle. Anyway, I don't want to bust on this car or Dodge too much because it really is a beautiful car. It's just the attitude they had when they were announcing the vehicle or the attitude that the person doing the announcing had uh, was very off-putting as somebody who's an electric vehicle enthusiast. And they're definitely talking to people who have gasoline running through their veins. But no matter how hard Dodge tries, this is not an ICE vehicle. This is an electric vehicle and they should just embrace it. Because if people think this car is cool and they're a fan of what Dodge does, they're going to buy it. You don't all of this extra work into making vroom vroom sounds. It just isn't a good idea. You know what? I'm going to put a link. Uh, I'm going to put a, a clip in here. One second. So not, not, not the most annoying sound in the world, but also I, I, don't, I just can't see listening to that all the time. Moving on, NEO announced their plan to enter the U.S. market with 24 other countries and regions by the end of the year, or excuse me, by the end of 2025, not the end of the year, that'd be crazy. Right before the pandemic hit, it was in March of 2020, I was actually trying to find a Safeway in San Jose. I got lost. And I ran into Neo's offices there, which was pretty cool. It is sort of close to the Safeway, though. Anyway, we don't know if Neo is going to be bringing their battery swap stations here in the U.S., um, but I'd like to see them expand that service to other countries, especially here. I think that would be really cool. Right now, Neo sells the ES7, which is an SUV, ET5, which is kind of like a Model 3 type car, ET7, a little bit bigger sedan. They just started building that. The EC6, the ES8, and the ES6, all of those vehicles are SUVs or crossovers in the case of the EC6. So I don't know. I'm excited. I think Neo is a great company, and I can't wait for them to, to get here. F-150 Lightning owners will receive 250 kilowatt hours of free fast charging from Electrify America via Ford Pass Rewards. Just in case you're curious, 250 kilowatt hours gets you about 575 miles. So not a lot, but better than nothing. 575 miles is a pretty good road trip there and back. So this only applies to Lightning retail customers, not the pro customers, by the way. Vietnamese automaker VinFast announced that they will give U.S. customers a $7,500 discount if their new electric EVs, the VF8 and the VF9, don't qualify for the U.S. tax credit. 
here's an email to reservation holders or a segment of an email to reservation holders. VinFast is a brand that not only stands behind our vehicle with our 10 year, 125,000 mile warranty, but more importantly, we stand behind our customers for customers who apply for the $7,500 tax credit under current IRC 30D requirements and are denied by the IRS for reasons not attributable to the customer. VinFast will provide the customer with a $7,500 purchase rebate or similar rebate on their VinFast vehicle. The binding agreement contains additional details on eligibility for the rebate, blah, blah, blah. We've talked in the past about VinFast, uh, especially in around when they first announced that CES, I think the VF8 and the VF9, which are fairly good size uh, SUVs, I think they're going to be a really good car for here in the United States where SUVs reign. Um, I haven't got a chance to get a closer look at them to see, you know, kind of where, where the quality lies, but I think it's going to be a, a good offering from VinFast as long as, you know, they take care of the customer and they don't have too many problems after production. And I guess during production, I don't love the idea of a battery subscription, which is kind of what they're pushing, but you can also buy the battery outright. These pr prices for the VF8 and VF9 don't include the battery from what I understand. So the VF8 will start at 40,700 40, and the VF9 will start at 55,500 respectively. So yeah. Um, and since we're going to talk about the tax credit, let's go ahead and talk about the U S federal tax credit since we're on that subject. President Biden signed the inflation reduction act into law. Before we start plug-in hybrids qualify for this. I'm not going to talk about plug-in hybrids. I don't talk about hybrids on the show. I just want to throw in one additional disclaimer. There is a lot about this bill that I think people are still trying to figure out. I've sourced this story from multiple articles, and I don't know if those articles got everything 100% right, because some of the articles I read contradicted other things that I read in other articles. So I tried to put together the most accurate uh, representation of what this bill is, but I may say some things that are not 100% correct. So just let me know and I'll correct them. Um, and if I find out something I said wasn't correct, I'll correct it on my own, but just throwing that out there before we get too crazy. So the EV tax credit, is it all that we hoped for? Well, I'll let you be the judge. The tax credit is still $7,500, although there are circumstances where the credit will be half at $3,750. This form of the tax credit will expire in 10 years. You get up to $4,000 for used EVs. And there's a caveat there that the tax rebate cannot exceed 30% of the purchase price of the used EVs. So if you bought a car for $10,000, you're not going to get $4,000 rebate. You're going to get a $3,000 rebate. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm not sure if you have to buy the car from a dealer or if you can do this through a private seller. Wasn't able to find that out. But if you're going to buy it from a private seller before you do that, you should make sure that that is the case. The limit of 200,000 vehicles sold per manufacturer has been removed. Manufacturers like Tesla, who burned through those 2,000 vehicles a year and a half or so ago, will have access to those credits yet again. And to be more specific, customers who buy from these manufacturers will have those credits, not Tesla themselves. So there are limits on customers who buy EVs. Individuals who make over $150,000, uh, head of households who make over $225,000, or couples who make over $300,000 would not qualify for these tax credits. As far as manufacturing requirements goes, Vehicles must be assembled in North America. That means North, uh, that means uh, U.S., Canada, and Mexico. A certain amount of the battery components and raw materials must be sourced from North America. So critical battery materials in 2023, 40% of the critical mi minerals that go into the battery need to be extricated or processed here in the United States or any country that the United States has a free trade deal with. By 2027, that number will be 
Now, as far as battery components go, in 2023, 50% of the battery components need to be manufactured or assembled in the United States or in North America, excuse me. By 2024, that number will be 60%, and by 2029, it'll be 100%. So pretty aggressive there. According to the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, when this law goes into effect, which I believe it kind of has, no EV currently sold would qualify for the tax credit. And about 70% of the vehicles that use that, that did at one point qualify no longer qualify. I do believe that the base Model 3 does qualify, but the other versions of the Model 3 and Model Y do not qualify unless Tesla can get the Model Y classified as an SUV. I think right now it's classified as a crossover. If you're out there and you're buying an EV from a dealer or a private seller and you're not sure if your vehicle qualifies, you can enter the VIN number on the DOT's website, Department of Transportation's website, to find out if it does qualify and it'll tell you. So that's pretty cool. This law doesn't fully take effect until January 1st, 2023, although some of the provisions of the law are in effect now. Um, there's a little difference in how you receive your tax credit money. So it used to be that you have to wait till you filed your taxes. Starting January 1st, 2024, you'll have the option of immediately receiving your rebate at the point of sale, or you can transfer that uh, money to the dealership. It's kind of up to you as to how you want to do that. So I looked up, and there's some articles on this. I looked up one, which vehicles currently apply. And I'm excluding the plug-in hybrids because, like I said, I'm not talking about hybrids on the show. The vehicles that qualify today are the Audi Q5, which I saw one of those the other day. It's a really good-looking car. The BMW X5, the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Ford Mustang Mach-E, the Ford Transit van, the Lucid Air, Nissan Leaf, Rivian R1S and R1T. There are like three R1Ts rolling around my neighborhood. They are beautiful. One is orange, one's blue, and one's white. It's great. Oh, man, they're so good-looking cars, trucks. And the 2023 Mercedes EQS. After January 1st, these are the vehicles that are going to qualify the 2022-2023 Chevy Bolt EV, the Bolt EUV, the GMC Hummer, pick up an SUV. I guess the Model 3 S, X, and Y could qualify. I, I, found some, I found some articles that say they do. I don't think all of those qualify. And the 2023 Cadillac Lyric. All right, like I said, I tried to be as accurate as possible on this. I don't know that I got 100% of this correct. And this is why I keep hounding on it. So hopefully I did. If I'm wrong, let me know. If I find out I'm wrong, I'll correct it. So it's still pretty new this week. All right, everybody, that is it for the show this week. I want to thank Sarah Poulton for taking the time and joining me. I had a really good time. Hopefully everyone will go and check out her podcast, Stay the Night. Uh, you can find a link in the show notes for the trailer, and you can also follow Sarah on Twitter. It's at S A R A P O L T O N. And if you can't remember that, I'll put a link to her Twitter account in the show notes as well. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful day and I will see you next week.